Hello everybody and welcome back to a brand new series on the channel, a review series where I'll delve deep into the Metal Fight Beyblade manga and give my overall thoughts on each chapter. Today we'll be covering the first chapter Descending Pegasus, as well as comparing the differences between the manga version and the anime adaptation. So if you've never read or planned to read the Metal Fight manga, be warned that this video will contain spoilers. However, you'll also gain a better appreciation for the Metal Fight series as a whole. So with that out of the way, let's jump straight in. The chapter begins with our first introduction to Jinga, with him sleeping on top of a tall structure by a bridge along with his bear Pegasus. The scene then cuts below to where three kids are bear battling, introducing us to the concept of Metal Fight as well as our first look at Kenta Yumiya. Right away this location bears a striking resemblance to the bridge where Tyson and Kai first met in the original series. One aspect you'll notice right away is the very distinct art style of the manga, not only in terms of the blades, but the characters themselves. The bears we get to see lack a clear wheel, taking the form of the horoscope or pre-hybrid wheel series that released at the very start of Metal Fight in Japan, and I honestly love the whole aesthetic overall. Sure, they do look a little strange, especially if you're used to bears having a clear wheel on top of just a metal wheel, however I do think they suit the graffiti art inspired aesthetic Takafumi Adachi was going for, more than the hybrid wheel bears ever could. The battle on display begins to turn in Kenta's favour, and just as he was about to win they are interrupted by the face hunters led by none other than Benke, sporting a more sinister design than he ever had in the anime. Benke kicks the stadium out of the way and challenges Kenta and his friends to a battle for the right to be on this turf, and obviously he crushes the other two kids without any problems using his bull 145 sharp. Not that bull, at least not yet, but I like that Benke actually uses bull in some form rather than the generic bear he used at the very start of the anime. With only Kenta remaining he is next to challenge Benke and obviously is afraid to do so. Kenta is who you would come to expect, a timid kid without any real confidence when it comes to his blading ability, so he already has this preconceived notion that he's going to lose regardless of what happens, however he still accepts and the panel then cuts back to Jinga. Now Jinga is still sleeping but for some reason Pegasus 105 flat starts shaking towards the edge of the pillar, I'm not entirely sure what caused this, whether it's due to the vibrations from the vehicles on the bridge, the commotion beneath them or just Pegasus itself is not entirely made clear. Anyway as predicted Benke proves too much for Kenta, but effortlessly run Coming Sagittario to the edge of the stadium. Thanks to Kenta's scream of desperation, the battle is interrupted by Jinga of all people, just not in the way you'd expect. Hilariously, Kenta wakes Jinga up who proceeds to accidentally knock Pegasus off the edge of the pillar. In a panic, Jinga opts to dive off the edge after it instead of using the ladder he used to get up there in the first place, crashing onto the stadium head first before a winner could be decided. This is honestly my favourite part of this entire chapter, perfectly encapsulating Jinga's nature as a character, rather than the approach they took in the anime, where Jinga was portrayed a tad more seriously in the first handful of episodes, before we got the chance to see a glimpse into his goofier side. Now due to Jinga's interruption, Benke challenges Kenta again, as Jinga tries to figure out what the hell's going on. This leads to a cute little exchange between Kenta and Jinga, where Kenta explains that if you lose to the face hunters, they'll steal your bear, only for Jinga to respond sporting a deadpan expression telling him to just win. This is obviously easy easy for Jinga to say and of course such a blanket response sends Kenta off into a frenzy as he simply doesn't believe he has the strength to match Bull. Jinga tells him something that we don't get to hear until later on and the rematch begins. Like before, Bull continues to push Sagittario around until Kenta is able to rally back turning the tables. It's here where we get to hear what Jinga whispered to Kenta before the battle. By cheering for his blade with all his heart, Kenta can defeat Benke as it's the blade of spirit that determines the winner not the endurance or the attack power of the blade itself. Sagittarius sends Bull flying with such force that the bear collides with Benke's head, shaving off a line of his hair, the face hunters then fleeing from the scene. This is the first interaction Kenta has with Jinga, and whilst the anime did maintain some of the familiar beats present in this chapter, such as Kenta's admiration and intrigue for Jinga, I do prefer how the manga handles this overall. I feel this is a better character moment for Kenta to defeat Benke himself, rather than Jinga suddenly appearing to save him. The manga still gives Kenta a reason to look up to Jinga, without making him appear utterly useless as a result. In the aftermath, Jinga departs, leaving Kenta absolutely mesmerised, and this is the extent of their personal interaction within this chapter, which was weird for me coming off the anime where they do actually have a good conversation and connect with one another after the battle with Benke. We are then brought back to Kenta and his friends departing home as it's getting dark. He's obviously still really excited about his victory and of course meeting Jinga, so much so that Kenta doesn't realise he was being watched until it was too late. Hanging upside down from a steel pipe, the leader of the face hunter Kiyoya appears, also having interest in the mysterious Jinga. To draw Jinga right, out, Kiyoya kidnaps Kenta leaving poses all over town, telling Jinga or as they call him Bandana Boy to head to the construction site in order to save him. 
This definitely brings back shades of the original Baki to shoot Beyblade for me, where Kai and his gang kidnapped Kenny to lure Tyson into the abandoned warehouse. I guess Takafumi Adachi was a big fan of the original to take inspiration from it in such a way. Eventually Jinga does show up and this is where we get our first good look at Kiyoya's design. He definitely has a more menacing presence in the manga with his gangster aesthetic and I didn't notice until I took a closer look that his gold chain isn't even a gold chain, it's literally a chain of all the blades he's stolen. It's cheesy but I absolutely love how badass he looks. And beside him on the construction beam we have a tied up Kenta who's obviously relieved to see Jinga again. Jinga wants Kenta and Kiyoya agrees to let him go if he can defeat him in a battle. He agrees which Kiyoya laughs at the fort only for them to be surrounded by the rest of the face hunters. Before battling Jinga himself, Kiyoya wants to test his strength first through the infamous 100 blade of battle. We do get a closer look at Pegasus here, only to find that his metal wheel has been completely scratched up. And the face hunters take this as Pegasus being essentially garbage, Kenta is the only one to clock onto the fact that the scratches were actually battle scars from all of his previous intense battles, furthering his intrigue in Jinga and where he even came from. As the 100 bears circle around him, Jinga takes up a peculiar stance, launching Pegasus into the fray. The face hunters quickly realise their mistake as Pegasus rips through them with a single attack. Just like before, Benki's hairline takes yet another hit, forming a cross and Jinga reiterates that it's the blade of spirit which determines the victor, the spirit of Pegasus emerging, soaring into the heavens. The chapter reaches its end with Jinga catching Pegasus, teasing his first battle with Kiyoya in the next chapter. Now there's a lot to unpack here in terms of the changes made when adapting this chapter to the anime. Whilst for the most part the first episode doesn't deviate narratively from the basic framework present, there are a number of minor and major changes made which we'll get into now. The more obvious changes pertain to the overall aesthetic and art design used in the manga, along with the inclusion of the metal system bays. Instead of Flash Sagittario, Kenta uses his Sagittario 125 sharp flat, and this goes for every character we see in this chapter across the board. Our initial introduction to Kenta also takes place in an entirely different setting as well. Bay Park is notably absent here as Kenta is blading with his friends underneath the bridge, rather than the tournament like in the anime. Speaking of his friends, whilst they remain completely unnamed here, they aren't the minor characters we see in the anime, in Osamu, Akira and Takashi. The same also applies to Jinga's introduction as well. In the manga, he's seen sleeping with Pegasus. Whilst this also occurs in the anime as well, it's left until around the midpoint of the episode, with Jinga first walking around the city earlier in the day. That's it for all of the minor changes. Now we'll cover some of the more notable distinctions between the manga and anime versions. First up is Kenta's confrontation with the Face Hunters. Not only is the location completely different along with the time of day, Kenta is ultimately the one to defeat Benke, instead of Jinga taking on the battle for him. Kenta's conversation with Jinga after the battle is also entirely missing from the manga version, this altering the entire stakes of the 100 blade of battle. In this version, Kiyoya kidnaps Kenta forcing Jinga to act in order to save him, but in the anime he is woken up by Benke and the rest of the gang who take him to the construction site by force. Kenta only appears in the anime counterpart as he spends the entire day looking for Jinga throughout the city, stumbling into the battle by complete accident. The face hunters also have an edge to them in the manga and are a lot closer to what you'd expect from a gang, rather than the typical bullies we encounter in the anime which definitely makes you take them more seriously in this version. Overall though, the anime does remain faithful enough when adapting the story beats of this first chapter to the anime, and in some respects I think it did a better job when it came to developing Kenta's relationship with Jinga, which the pacing of this first chapter didn't really provide them with the opportunity of doing so here. Overall though, I really enjoyed this chapter. It did an excellent job in introducing us to the world of Metal Fight and its characters. Whilst it does feel a little weird reading this after watching the anime, none of the characters really feel out of place, and I think in some regards they work better in this version, especially Kenta. I love the graffiti inspired art design Takafumi Adachi went with, as it gives Metal Fight its own identity, something I feel the anime took away with its more polished character design and overall generic art direction. My only potential gripe with this chapter was that the pacing at times did feel a little bit rushed. It didn't really give any opportunity to let things breathe and to be expanded upon, such as Kenta's relationship with Jinga. However, I don't believe it works to its detriment either, although I would appreciate more character interaction going forward into the next few chapters, something I do expect will happen sooner rather than later. But yeah, that's all I've really got to say on this one. Descending Pegasus was a great introduction to the manga, and I'm really looking forward to see where this story ends up going. Anyway, that's all from me, and if you made it this far, thanks for sticking around until the end. If you want to see more Beyblade content like this on the channel, then make sure to subscribe and smash that like button. The support is truly appreciated. Also, let me know your overall thoughts on this chapter, and where you think the direction of the story is heading down below. Take care, and I'll see you in the next one.